Okay, a very good evening to everybody, and thank you all for joining this month's film reading session. For those of you who haven't joined us for these sessions in the past, just a very quick introduction. My name's uh, Ian. Um, I graduated from the RVC way back in 2003. Um, I did my imaging certificate um, in 2009, um, after a couple of years spent in um, first opinion practice, and um, I did my residency at the RVC uh, between 2013 and 2016, finally getting my European diploma um, in 2018. And these days, um, you can find me at London Veterinary Specialists, which is a multidisciplinary referral hospital in North London. And uh, if uh, you do have any questions at all that are imaging related, um, don't be a stranger. So if you'd like to have a chat about uh, what sort of imaging would be most appropriate um, for a case that you're working up, or if you need a hand interpreting some radiographs, then either um, drop me a line via the email um, or give me a call, and I'll be more than happy to help you guys out. So uh, this evening, we're going to have a little run through four cases. Now, you guys will have had access to the cases for um, the last week or so, and um, you're encouraged to write a radiology report for each of the cases before these sessions. Um, don't spend too long on each case, uh, so roughly about 15 minutes, and try and include um, a description of the most pertinent radiographic findings for each of the cases, um, a conclusions section, which um, should uh, include a list of differential diagnoses and try and rank your differentials from those that you would consider to be most likely from those that are least likely, and then also provide some recommendations. So if you feel that a patient might benefit from additional imaging, so for example, if you think an abdominal ultrasound might be helpful, um, or a CT uh, might prov provide some further light on what exactly is going on in that particular case, um, then that's the section to include that information. So before we start, we'll just have a look at an example, and um, I'll quickly run through this. Um, this is a case that we covered in one of our earlier film reading sessions. This is a five-year-old female neutered crossbreed dog um, that's presented to us as dyspneic. And for this example, we have just a single radiograph. Um, it's a left lateral thoracic radiograph. And in this radiograph, uh, what we can see um, is that the pulmonary parenchyma is retracted from the thoracic wall. Um, the cardiac silhouette is also elevated and the um, opacity um, of the pleural space is abnormal. Um, it's more radiolucent, which is indicative of there being gas um, within the pleural space. So this patient um, has uh, a pneumothorax um, and our recommendation would be uh, that this patient has uh, thoracocentesis uh, further uh, sooner rather than later. Um, there are a couple of other little changes that uh, you might want to mention in your radiology report. So um, there's quite a bit of gas in the stomach of this patient, um, as well as some mineralized material. So um, this patient has uh, had a meal um, in the recent past before developing this pneumothorax. There's a couple of bones in the stomach. Um, but those features are certainly less pertinent than the retraction and compression of the uh, pulmonary parenchyma and the lung lobes, the elevation of the cardiac silhouette and the gas within the pleural space. So that's the example, which brings us on to uh, case number one, which is a two-year-old female neutered domestic short hair that's uh, presented to you as having suffered a road traffic accident. Um, so uh, these sessions um, are very much interactive. Um, so this is an opportunity for you guys to uh, share your thoughts um, on these cases. Um, and then as a group, uh, we can have uh, a little chat about um, the findings and discuss what we think the most likely diagnosis is um, for each of these cases. So um, case number one, a young cat has been hit by a car. Um, which of you guys fancies taking case number one? Could be can I try an author one, please, Ian? Yeah, absolutely. So this this is indeed the obligatory 
ortho case of the uh, group this evening. So yeah, if you fancy the ortho, then yeah, go right ahead. Thank you. Yes, uh, so I think we have a VDM right lateral um, radiographs um, of a skeletally mature cat. Um, I think the VD is slightly rotated. Um, I think the right obturator foramen looks a bit kind of smaller than the left one. Um, I think the main findings was, I think there's a fracture of the body of the left ischium. Um, I think I'd describe it as comminuted, comminuted, <laughs> comminuted um, but I wasn't sure if it was perhaps maybe segmental, so I don't know if that's maybe a little floating piece there rather than comminuted. Um, I think kind of both fracture lines are oblique. Um, I'd say kind of moderately displaced, um, I think quadrilaterally. Um, I don't think there's any evidence um, of it being an open fracture um, and there's no stenosis of the pelvic inlet um, but there is kind of a lot of feces in the colon. Um, on Moving on to the, the lateral I think um, there's kind of good serosal detail. Um, I think the bladder kind of appears intact um, and I, I can see any new fractures on this view. Um, so I guess recommendation is just social fixation of that previous one. Okay. Yeah, no, um, yeah, I like your description. I like the fact that you've uh, commented uh, on the bladder. Uh, so this cat uh, certainly has suffered some trauma and I'm being confident that this patient doesn't have a bladder rupture that might require further investigation um, is uh, reassuring. Um, in terms of uh, the diagnosis, absolutely. So um, there's uh, multiple pelvic fractures here. So um, the way that uh, I described these fractures um, was to try and work out uh, how many composite fragments there are. And, and here I think um, there are three composite fragments. So there's a fragment that comprises the um, left uh, hemipelvis, uh, which includes the acetabulum. Um, there's a fragment that comprises the cranial part of that left ischium, and then there's a fragment that comprises the left ischiatic table. Um, so uh, the fragments and their position is probably the next thing that I'd uh, mention. Um, so the uh, larger um, fragment comprising the left hemipelvis, um, that's, that's not too displaced. It's maybe displaced a little bit medially. So um, just at the level of the, the acetabulum, there's maybe just very slight narrowing of that pelvic canal, but um, not too much. Uh, the issue fragment, which uh, is, is this fragment here, um, I think that's uh, displaced a little bit um, cranially, um, and its caudal aspect is rotated laterally. Um, in the lateral view, um, I think that's also displaced a little bit um, dorsally as well. I think it's, it's probably here in this radiograph. And the fragment that's comprising the left asiatic table, um, that, that's rotated a little bit um, dorsally um, and laterally. Um, and this left acetabulum, I think, appears intact. Um, so certainly um, a whole bunch of, of pelvic fractures. Um, I'm not sure that I would describe this as, as a comminuted fracture. So for me, a comminuted fracture, um, it needs to be um, at least three, if not more, composite fragments. And it needs to be several sort of fissure lines, fracture lines, that are converging in order for me to really start describing its comminuted. Uh, so um, there are multiple pelvic fractures um, involving um, principally the, the left issue, um, but I'm not sure I describe it as comminuted. I, I agree it doesn't look open, so we can't see any subcutaneous emphysema. Um, and uh, I agree that uh, the other structures in terms of uh, the bladder and, and the left acetabulum, they all look like they're intact. Um, so, uh, is there anything else on this lateral view that we might need to uh, describe that might potentially give us a clue as to there being potentially another problem in this camp that, that might need further investigation? And um, that's that's to to anybody else on the floor. So, so what do you guys make, make of this structure here? So you can't really see it in the VD view, but in the lateral view, um, there's, there's certainly a little mineralized structure in the cordoventral abdomen. What do we think? Is that, is that normal? Is it abnormal? If it's abnormal, then what could that be? How how significant might that be in terms of the scouts injuries? 
I'm not entirely sure what that is. Yeah. So, if we look at the pelvis, there, there is a uh, structure um, which uh, is called the, uh, well, it's the pubic tubercle, which is here. And there's, there's a whole bunch of muscles that insert um, at the, 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 this tubercle, the pubic tubercle. So there's um, the linear alba as well as a bunch of abdominal muscles. And in cats that have suffered uh, trauma, um, like an RTA, um, sometimes you can get a fracture of this um, pubic tubercle, um, and essentially uh, avulsion of the prepubic tendon. So it's the prepubic tendon that attaches here at this pubic tubercle. Um, and is, is sort of the anchor point for a lot of the ventral abdominal musculature. And the fact that we're seeing a small mineralized structure just cranial to this, um, this pubic tubercle, um, and also uh, the margins of the ventral abdominal wall between this mineralized structure and the prepubic tubercle are a little bit effaced. So, so here we can see the abdominal wall beautifully. It's got very clear dorsal and ventral margins. And then just between this little mineralized structure and the prepubic tubercle, the margins are effaced. It's really difficult to, to make out the abdominal wall here. That combined with the fact that we've got a little mineralized structure, which looks like um, it's within the abdominal wall, um, and the prepubic tubercle looks like it's in an abnormal shape. So, so normally it's not quite as, as convex as this. Um, should, should mean that should be suspicious here that there's uh, avulsion of the prepubic tendon. Um, so that would be certainly something else to include. I mean, in your um, report, um, the fact that we've got a mineralized structure here in the cordoventral abdomen, the fact that we've got effacement of the cordoventral abdominal walls, um, and also the, the shape of the, um, the tubercle, the pubic tubercle here, is a little bit abnormal. So we'd be suspicious here that this cat could have um, at least a partial avulsion um, of the prepubic tendon, and that would mean that it would be predisposed to. Um, some rupturous abdominal wall and herniation of abdominal contents, which just didn't actually happen in this case. But this is a nice example um, of a potential um, avulsion of the prepubic tendon and um, fracture of just the tip of that pre of that pubic tubercle. Okay. Anybody else uh, spot that? Have any comments? Um, have anything else to say about the pelvic fractures um, or this possible prepubic tendon avulsion? Yeah, everybody happy with that? Okay. Anybody have any other questions about case number one? All right, cool. All right, nice job. So <clears throat> let's move on to case number two, uh, which is a little different. <clears throat> so case number two is <clears throat> a 10-year-old female neutered uh, lurcher. Um, it's presented to you as dyspneic. Um, so who fancies uh, case number two? I'm happy to do it. <laughs> yeah, go for it. So this is, uh, yeah, this is uh, a thoracic case rather than an orthopedic case. So it's going to be more interesting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, we have two radiographic projection. One is a right lateral and the other one is a DV projection of a skeletally mature dog. Um, can you go back on the, yeah. yeah. So regarding the musculoskeletal structure, um, at the level of the ribs, what I can see is a sort of uneven surface of the ribs. Um, they, they don't look really smooth. And if we check on the DV as well, uh, it looks like there is a sort of double, um, double, double bone, like a sort of new bone formation surrounding um, possible the inner uh, face of, of, of the ribs mm, yeah. and um, regarding the, the lung parenchyma what we what we see essentially we see an increase of the of the fissure uh, of the fissure line so we can uh, well um, underlying essentially the different lung lobes and also I think it's the right accessory lung lobe it looks like um, a bit squished, a bit um, pushed dorsally. In the la in the right lateral projection as well, we can see there is a scalloping of the of the ventral um, 
aspect of the lung globes, which they are retra retracted from the sternum. And there is this um, superimposition of soft tissue opacity, which um, is likely to be fluid. And also the lung parenchyma looks um, like sort of hyperinflated, I think is because it's pushed or is, is retracted by the quantity of, uh, of the pleural fluid. Um, the cardiac silhouette, he looks within the normal limits, although is partially faced by lung parenchyma and, and fluid. And also the diaphragmatic outline, they looks, um, they looks within the normal limit, although the ventral part of the diaphragm is partially effaced by the soft tissue opacity. Um, so I think um, there is pleural fluid, uh, there is an increase of the, um, of the fissure, the, the fissure line. Um, there is a sort of new bone formation reaction within the ribs. Um, I will go as my first differential diagnosis as a neoplasia. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if um, it's a primary from the pleural, from the pleura rather than primary from, from the bone and the bone secondary is reactive. So uh, I, I, I'm not sure if it's a sort of mesothelioma or diffuse carcinomatosis, although I cannot see any real nodule within the lung parenchyma. Um, there was another thing on the DV that I've seen, and I'm not sure if at the level of the right, at, at the beginning, at the origin of the right caudal um, uh, bronchus, there is a sort of uh, ill-defined, um, sort of um, um, bulla cavity, but I think is maybe probably a sort of um, is between is at the level of the ninth um, rib. I, I'm not sure if it's a sort of uh, bronchiectasis or it's just superimposition of um, I, I I don't know fluid slash pleural fluid. Um, I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. Great. So um, we're going with pleural effusion and possible neoplasia. Well, um, yeah, I, I yeah. will probably yeah I will probably like uh, tap the fluid and and check for you know if there are any neoplastic cells and then probably repeat the X-rays or um, probably suggest recommend a CT if yep. if the dog is stable. Okay. Yeah. Great. I absolutely agree. Um, so, I mean, for me, uh, the the changes secondary to the pleural effusion um, are not too tricky to see. So, um, as we've stated, there's certainly some effacement of the cardiac silhouette. So we can see um, most of the borders of the dorsal cardiac silhouette in the lateral view, but the ventral borders are pretty tricky to see. Um, there are some pleural fissure lines here. We, we can see some pleural fissure lines in uh, the lateral view um, and also um, the DV view as well. And um, there's also, as you pointed out, some scalping of the um, edges of the lung lobes and also flattening of the diaphragm, um, compatible with some hyperinflation. So we can be pretty confident that there's um, pleural effusion here, maybe not um, a huge volume, but certainly um, enough to make this dog dyspneic. Now, um, what's uh, impressive is that you've picked up the changes to the ribs. So I, I think these are, are quite, um, tricky to see and you really have to remember <coughs> to check the ribs every time you look at a set of thoracic films in order to pick this up because the <coughs> raised cariosteal reaction <coughs> that we can see affecting uh, almost all of these ribs um, just sort of blends into um, the uh, plural borders um, of the cortices of the bodies of these ribs but if you, if you look carefully you can see that in, in on most of these ribs there's this 
smooth raised periosteal reaction and it really is um, quite exuberant and we really don't see that very often at all so this is um, one of the first times that I've seen um, this sort of exuberant smooth raised periosteal reaction affecting um, this number of ribs and uh, when we start to pick up lesions affecting bone and in this case the ribs we need to try and decide whether these lesions are aggressive or benign or whether um, it's, it's monostotic or polyostotic. So, so here we've got these, this, this polyostotic change, this, this raised, smooth, exuberant periosteal reaction affecting the, um, the pleural surface of, of all of these ribs. And it's really difficult to know what might have, have caused that. I mean, potentially something um, within the pleural space um, and certainly something neoplastic um, might be responsible for this. Um, I mean, in terms of what else could be going on, well, I mean, if this was a pyothorax, could that really result in this amount of periosteal reaction affecting all those ribs? Um, it would be unusual. Certainly we've seen you know, lots of examples of pyothorax. I've never seen a pyothorax have ribs that, that look like this. Um, and uh, I mean, in terms of other, di other differentials for kind of polyosmotic bone lesions that can potentially be um, aggressive and neoplastic, well, I mean, could these be bone mets? They don't, they don't really have the typical appearance of bone mets, secondary to something like a mammary carcinoma or a thyroid carcinoma or a prostatic carcinoma. I mean, they're, they're usually sort of focal and, uh, and more lytic. I mean, this is, um, this is quite diffuse and it's affecting all the ribs and it. it's quite exuberant. Um, I mean, here, could this be uh, like a round cell tumor, like a multiple myeloma? Well, again, it, it wouldn't really be typical um, because I mean, usually it's the vertebral bodies. And again, it's, it's usually focal lytic lesions rather than um, exuberant, smooth, raised periosteal reaction. So, um, I mean, I, I didn't really know what could be causing this when I first looked at, at these radiographs. And I think um, coming down on the side of neoplasia and saying, well, could, could this be secondary to something neoplastic in, in the pleural space um, is, is a really good shout. Uh, so uh, this dog went on to have um, a CT, um, which we can have a look at. Um, before we have a look at the CT, is everybody happy with the changes that we've just described in these thoracic radiographs? Um, I, I think you know, if you didn't spot these changes to the ribs, um, I wouldn't worry. Um, I, I think um, you know, they, that's, that's easily missed. Um, the reason why I've included this uh, set of radiographs in this month's session is, is just to remind everybody, always look at the ribs. <clears throat> so, you know, it could be that you looked at these films and you said, you know what, there's a facement of the cardiac silhouette, there's pleural fissure lines, um, there's some scalloping, um, this dog has a pleural effusion. And there's, there's something called a satisfaction of search where you, you found some abnormalities and so you stop looking for them. Um, and in this case, um, you needed to continue looking um, and to also remember to check the ribs. So, so that's why this case is in here. And uh, we can uh, look a bit further and a bit harder with a CT scan in just a second. So everybody happy with, with these radiographs and the changes we've just described? Because if we are, then we can move on and we can have a look at the CT. Uh, which looks a little bit like this. So this is um, a 2.5 millimeter uh, bone reconstruction we're going to look at um, initially. Um, so uh, we'll just we'll just run run through it, and you guys um, can just uh, have a look at uh, the ribs predominantly because it's the ribs that we're most interested in. And and the CT here is uh, really confirming the changes that we can see on those thoracic radiographs. So all of the ribs um, on their pleural surface have this raised, exuberant, smooth periosteal reaction. So we'll just take it back so slightly. Hopefully all of you guys can appreciate that. So we'll just stop it at, let's say, let's look for a particularly irregular looking bit. Maybe, maybe this bit here. So, so here, um, let's just get my laser pointer. Uh, if we look at the, this rib here, you can see that this, this is actually the rib um, and that's, that's the cortex associated with um, the pleural side of that rib. And here we've got this, this really raised, irregular um, periosteal reaction. And we can see it a little bit more dorsally. And on the other side, we've got similar changes. So again, there's this raised periosteal reaction affecting pretty much all, all of those ribs, really. So we'll just play that through again. And you guys can uh, admire the changes to this dog's ribs one more time in this bone reconstruction. This huge amounts of this periosteal reaction. 
and to finish off, we're going to have a now have a look at this is a 2.5 millimeter. This is a, a post contrast soft tissue reconstruction. So, so here, just before we start, so this is all the pleural effusion. Here. So, so this this is the lung, that's the trachea, that's that's part of the heart, and then this this uh, hypo attenuating material we can see in the ventral aspect of the thorax here. That's that's the pleural effusion that we we're seeing on the radiographs. So. I'll just run through this soft tissue reconstruction. You guys just maybe try and keep an eye out for anything that you think might give us a little bit more of a clue as to what's caused all the changes in these groups. Okay, I'm going to stop it there and just bring it back. So anybody see anything as we were driving through? That there there is an nodule. Yeah. Uh, it's on the, I think it's right, dorsal aspect, dorsolateral aspect of the right. Yeah, it's there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just here, we've got this, this soft tissue attenuating structure that uh, is demonstrating quite strong diffuse enhancement. And this structure looks like it's originating from the pleura. So we've got quite a nice um, extrapleural sign here. So the angle between the thoracic wall and this structure um, is, is very weak. Um, so that's, that's a nice extrapleural sign. And this is a, a pleural module. Um, and there's a couple of these little pleural lesions. So let's just go back to the CT. And we'll just run it forward right at the start. Okay, so we'll go through it a little bit more slowly this time. And we've got this, this plural module that we've already spotted, just there. And as we move coldly, there's maybe a little module there as well. But just here, we've got another one of these plural nodules. And then just ventral to the heart as well, there's, there's some tissue that, that really shouldn't be there. So just, just here, we've got, again, it's, it's soft tissue attenuating, and it, it's strongly enhancing, and the, the enhancement is pretty diffuse as well. So we've got multiple um, pleural nodules and potentially um, a pleural mass that's just ventral to the cardiac ciliary here. So, I mean, you've, you've already uh, given us the answer, actually, uh, in terms of what this dog actually had. But before I reveal that, um, so if you guys were presented with this case, what, what do you think the next thing to do would be? We, we've already drained some of this, this effusion off and that's going to go off to the lab and they're going to take a look at the supernatal to try and see some of your plastic cells in it. Um, anything else you guys might want to do before this dog gets off the gantry? So what, what we decided to do <coughs> was to maybe have a can, go at Can we find needle the nodule? I mean, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, so, it's quite close to the thoracic wall. Yeah, absolutely. So so there's, we've got this, these, these nodules here. Now, because they're plural, they're, they're quite superficial. So it's certainly worth taking a look with the ultrasound and, and seeing if we can see these nodules, because if we can see them, then there's a chance that, that we can hit them. Um, and that's, that's exactly what we did. Uh, so this is an ultrasound image of one of those um, pure modules. So I mean, hopefully you guys can see what's going on here. So uh, essentially what I've done is I've looked at the CT scan and I've counted the ribs and I've popped my probe on the appropriate intercostal space and I've just done a little bit of fanning of my probe to try and find this module. And so what we're looking at here is this, this edge here is the edge of the lung and that's uh, abnormal um, because um, it's being dis displaced by, by the structure here. Um, so that's one of the pleural nodules that we can see on the CT scan. Um, now, fortunately, this um, structure was superficial enough and accessible enough uh, for me to uh, pop a needle in it. Um, so, so we FNA'd um, this nodule and um, came back as a uh, mesothelioma. Um, so yeah, you absolutely got the diagnosis straight off the back of those um, thoracic radiographs. Um, so this dog has um, kind of a primary pleural neoplasia, um, so mesothelioma, and as a result of that neoplasia, it's got 
the changes that we can see to the periosteum affecting pretty much all of its wounds. Um, so this is a confirmed mesothelioma. We've got thoracic, radi we've got thoracic radiographs, CT, and a nice ultrasound image of one of these pleural nodules. And uh, yeah, it's it's. I've not really seen um, a mesothelioma have those sorts of rib changes before. So I thought this was a really interesting one. And like I say, one of the reasons why this case was included um, is because it reminds us um, that if we start seeing abnormalities that we're confident about, um, we should keep looking. So don't be caught out by the satisfaction of search and always check the ribs um, in any thoracic radiographs um, that you're reviewing because there could be some sneaky rib lesions there um, that are very easily missed. So yeah, nice job. Um, so yeah, I've got a diagnosis off the back of the thoracic radiographs. So this dog had a mesothelic coma. So yeah, good work. Nice job. Everybody happy with case number two? Yeah? Okay, so that brings us to case number three, which is um, a one-year-old male neutered Abyssinian cat uh, that's presented to you with a painful abdomen. So who fancies case number three? This I can give a go. Yeah, go for it. So this is this is a nice case. This is um this is absolutely the sort of case that you guys are going to see in, in first opinion practice. So one year old managed Abyssinian. It's got a sore tummy, sore abdomen. Okay. Okay. So there are there are uh, two projection orthogonal projection uh, lateral and can you put the other one? Yeah. And I assume uh, dorsal ventral. If you come back on the lateral view, is a skeletal mature uh, cat. Uh, the serosal details are adequate, adequate, adequate. And uh, uh, if you there is a, a soft tissue opacity in the caudal aspect of the abdomen outside the abdominal wall. Uh, in the caudal ventral aspect, uh, in one in one part, uh, the the details of the abdominal wall are less defined. Mm -hmm. If we go on the other view, uh, in uh, in the same area, there is this soft tissue opacity seems to be. Uh, they look like uh, in t in intestinal loops uh, because there is like yes yeah, of tissue opacity with some gas opacity in there. So my main differential would be um, disruption in abdominal wall with the herniation of possible intestinal loop. Okay. Uh, also at that level, uh, I cannot really see. Uh, the colon, so I think there is like an abdominal rupture with herniation of a small in intestinal loop, yeah. Okay, yeah. All right. Uh, any, anybody else have anything to add for this series? Yeah, so um, in terms of your description, I absolutely agree. So <clears throat> the main change here is we've got this um, sort of streaky increase in radio opacity of the uh, ventral subcutis and we've got associated effacement of the margins of the abdominal wall in this lateral view and we can see similar changes um, on the left in this BD view. Um, so again we've got this streaky increase in opacity um, of the soft tissues and if we compare the clarity of the margins of the abdominal wall on the right versus the left. On the right, we can see the abdominal wall beautifully. On the left, um, as we start moving towards the um, caudal abdomen um, and the sacrum, um, we start to lose the abdominal wall. So we can still just about make out the margins, but um, certainly not as clear as we'd like it to be. Uh, in terms of, could these be loops of intestine? Uh, I suppose they could, we can't completely rule it out, except that we can see a whole bunch of, of small bowel that are all bunched together in the mid-abdomen here. And it doesn't really look like any of them are sticking out through the abdominal wall. So we can't completely rule it out, um, but it's it's probably less likely. Um, the colon we can see in this lateral view, so we can see the descending colon, it looks like 
um, it's uh, moving towards the um, pelvic inlet and the rectum looks like it's in a normal position. And on this view, um, again, we can, can see the descending colon. It's just displaced a little bit over to the right, but it doesn't look like it's, it's poking through that abdominal wall. So we can't completely rule it out in terms of there being a herniation of intestinal contents, but it's probably less likely. Um, the other thing that I, I might comment on, um, we commented on it for case number one, um, the cat that was the RTA, is the bladder. Um, so uh, because we've got uh, some changes um, to the uh, structures that are adjacent to the bladder, so the ventral abdominal wall and um, this subcutaneous fat, um, it's probably worth commenting on it. So when we can see the bladder, um, it, it, it looks like it's partially filled. Uh, we can't completely rule out um, a bladder rupture here just because of the changes that we're seeing to the soft tissues adjacent to it. Um, but it's, it's, it's maybe less likely. But it, it should still be on the differential list. Um, so uh, what would you guys like to do next? Um, do you think you're, you're happy enough with the radiographs and, and you're going to pop this cat in the kennel and leave it be? Or do you think we need to do some other studies here just to be confident that there isn't anything else going on here that might be a little bit more sinister that we might need to know about um, before um, finishing with this cat? I think that we uh, an, ult an ultrasound can yeah. be helpful as well to yeah. see if if there are uh, if there is any disruption. Yeah. And as well is depend how stable is the animal because yeah. uh, I don't know if it was really urgent and uh, we you needed to rush to theater or not. But yeah, ultrasound for sure will will be helpful. Okay, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, the cat, I think, was, was reasonably stable um, at this point. So, um, it was pretty sore um, when you were palpating its abdomen, but otherwise it was pretty stable. Um, so, the other thing that we did, we did do an ultrasound um, in this cat, um, but we wanted to be absolutely sure um, that this, this bladder and this urethra was intact. Um, so, uh, if you have uh, cats um, or dogs with um, either a bladder or urethral rupture, occasionally um, you can have urine uh, pooling in the cordoventral abdomen and um, causing a lot of inflammation to the cordoventral subcutis. Um, the fact that we've got a potential abdominal wall rupture here, um, we've not really got any other orthopedic injuries, suggests that this cat might have had a penetrating injury. So um, it could have been bitten by a dog, it, it could have fallen on something sharp and spiky. So we wanted to be absolutely sure um, that this bladder was intact um, before popping the probe um, patient. Um, so what we did was we did a retrograde urethrocystogram. Um, and here it is, at least this, uh, the urethro bit. Um, so yeah, uh, would anybody like to have a little look at this and let me know what you think? It's a little bit mean because I know you guys haven't had access to these images, so you're kind of reading them blind, but that's okay. It's going to be good practice. So what we've got here is, um, this is this is our catheter. Um, so the way that we've done this uh, retrograde urethrogram is we put a peripheral intravenous catheter just into the, the tip of the penis. Um, there's a little extension set there. It's been primed. Um, so there's some contrast in the extension set um, before we started to inject. Um, we've injected um, between three to five mils of um, using either Hexol here or Omnipake. And then we've, um, we've made the exposure um, about two thirds of the way through the injection. Um, so we've uh, pushed quite hard on the, um, the syringe just to try and generate a little bit of pressure in this urethra. Um, so it's nicely full when um, we've made the exposure. And uh, it's, it's, it's a reasonable radiograph. So for whatever reason, um, the, the, the tip of the penis is, is sort of displaced ventrally. So the, um, the position of the urethra isn't entirely normal, uh, but we've got good urethral filling here. So um, we, we can confidently assess um, the urethral lumen um, and the urethral mucosa and make a decision as to whether or not there's any evidence of any leakage of contrast out of the urethra. Um, so I mean, the question here really that we're trying to answer is, is there any evidence of a urethral rupture in this case? Um, so, so what do we think?
I don't, I don't think there is any rupture. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Um, I mean, so, I, I cannot see any extravasation of, of the contrast. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I, I completely agree. I think that urethra looks absolutely fine. So, um, you know, we, we can see the contrast is, is filling the urethra beautifully. Um, we can see the urethra margins beautifully. Um, and, yeah, there's no extravasation of contrast. So there's, there's no contrast that looks like it's leaking into the soft tissues adjacent to the urethra. So, I mean, if, if you do see leakage, then it, it tends to look um, like little um, wisps of, of contrast just adjacent to the urethral lumen. And also you will you'll struggle to get um, adequate filling of the urethral lumen because it's all leaking out. So here we, we can see we've got contrast that's just squirting into the lumen of the urinary bladder. There's a little bit of contrast pooling in the dependent part of the urinary bladder and a couple of little air bubbles. But, but there's certainly no evidence of a match here. So, so that's good. That's, that's reassuring. So um, in this one, we've uh, just injected a little bit more contrast. Um, so um, popped in another, um, I think, maybe 10 or 15 mils of contrast into this cat, uh, just to fill the bladder up. Um, so, so now we've got a bladder that's, that's full of contrast, and the urethra not quite so full. Um, so there's, there's still a little bit of contrast um, in the kind of intrapelvic portion of the urethra. Um, but most of it is now in the lumen of the urethra bladder. And we took two views, so we've got a VD and a lateral. Um, so next question to you guys is, do you think there's any evidence of any uh, leakage of contrast out of this bladder? So is there any evidence of um, a urinary bladder rupture? I don't think so. Yeah, no, I, can, I totally agree. Um, so again, all the contrast looks like it's, it's in the bladder, um, with beautifully clear margins, no, no wispy contrast. Nothing um, to make us concerned that there's any leakage from the urinary bladder in either the lateral view um, or the BD view. Um, so that's all good, which brings us on to the ultrasound. So this is um, just a single ultrasound image of the abdominal wall. So just to kind of orient you guys, I'm using uh, quite a high frequency linear probe here. And um, I have it on the uh, abdominal wall on the right, um, just called the umbilicus. And this is, this is the abdominal wall here, or at least that's one edge of the abdominal wall. And that's another edge of the abdominal wall here. And uh, the, arrow, the arrow is quite helpfully uh, pointing out a defect in the abdominal wall. And this high pericord material that we can see protruding through the abdominal wall um, into the subcutis um, is all um, some of these enteric fat. Um, so um, there certainly is a defect in the abdominal wall here, um, but fortunately there isn't any herniation of um, any uh, of the small or large bowel. Um, and the bladder is in the right place as well. We, we can be confident about that based on the radiographs. Um, just some, some herniation of the abdominal fat into the subcutaneous space. So I recorded a little video of that. Um, I'm not sure it really helps um, demonstrate exactly what's going on, but we can have a look at it anyway. So, so again, this is this is abdominal wall here. This is the defect, and that's that's what it should look like. So that's that's the abdominal wall that's that's intact there. Let me take another quick look at that. So I'm just going to pause it here. So that's that's one edge of the abdominal wall. That's the other edge. That's the hole. That's the fat that's poking through. This is me just, um, just fanning my probe of the defect until I found where the abdominal wall is continuous. Okay. So yeah, nice job. Um, so in uh, this case, um, I've included because it's a nice example of an abdominal wall rupture. Um, it's also a nice example of a retrograde um, urethrocystogram for us to have a look at, and um, an example of what an abdominal wall rupture looks like um, with ultrasound as well. Um, so uh, this got stitched up, and uh, the cat did very well indeed. Um, so yeah, good job. Um, so case number three, um, abdominal wall rupture in the cat. Um, no evidence of any herniation of any abdominal contents, um, and an intact bladder and urethra. Um, so that was number three. Nice job. Um, anybody have any questions about number three? Everybody happy? Okay. So that brings us on to number four, which is a three-year-old female muted Bernese mountain dog. Um, so a big dog uh, that's presented uh, to you coughing and retching. Um, so 
Um, who would like to take a crack at uh, case number four? Okay, this is this is a nice case. So we've, got, we've got a couple of radiographs to have a look at. We've got a right lateral thorax and we've got a VD thorax. Nobody wanted to do case number four. It's a nice case. Again, this is absolutely the sort of thing that could walk through the door of any first opinion practice in the country at any point. It's a, it's a nice one. I'll have a go, but I haven't had a lot of time to prep. So. That's, that's all right. Um, yeah, so this is, this is all about the discussion. So uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so we've got um, a skeletally mature dog and we've got a right lateral view and a DD view. Um, on the lateral view, um, I think it's an expiratory view because there's not very much space between um, the heart and the diaphragm. Um, the heart doesn't, I haven't done a heart score, but I don't think it looks particularly enlarged just because I think it's an expiratory view. I think that's why it looks a bit big. Um, though I thought there was a diffuse bronco-interstitial pattern, um, particularly um, dorsocordally. Um, the vessels were quite obvious, but not particularly enlarged, I don't think, in any of the spaces I can see. Um, I couldn't see any nodules. I was looking to see if I could see any pulmonary signs of any pulmonary edema, and I couldn't see any pulmonary edema, like any air bronchograms specifically to point towards any signs of pneumonia or anything. Um, the trachea looks in a normal position um, and looks a normal size and shape. Um, yes, yeah, so I couldn't see any problems with that and then yep. on the DV view. Oh, yeah, I'll just flick it. Here we go. Um, again, I thought that maybe it looked a bit more bronchial pattern in this view than on the other view, like it just looked a bit more maybe mineralized along the bronchi. bronchi. Um, the heart is quite like reverse D shaped, but again, I don't think it looked particularly enlarged so I wasn't thinking there was any heart problem. Yep. Um, the ribs look normal. Um, yeah I couldn't see anything else. Okay no that's, that's good. All right um, so uh, so we have got what we think is um, a normal cardiac silhouette and I absolutely agree. Um, we've got normal pulmonary vessels um, so we can see um, the artery, the bronchus, and the vein, those are the cranial lobar vessels, they look fine. They're, they're certainly no bigger than the adjacent rib. Um, we've had a look at the pulmonary parenchyma, and I absolutely agree. I think there maybe is um, a bit of a bronco interstitial pattern. So in this lateral view, um, we can see there are a few little donuts um, and tram lines, um, particularly in the dorsocaudal thorax. So we've got a few little donuts just here, and then some tram lines. So we could absolutely describe that as a bronco interstitial pattern. It could be, as you suggested, that that, that might be associated with expiration, um, because uh, they really isn't much of a gap between the caudal border of the cardiac cilia and the margins of the diaphragm. So this view could absolutely be expiratory um, in and this VD view. Again, it's a few little donuts around, so yeah, maybe a bronchointestitial pattern. Um, and the rest of the extra thoracic structures, um, like the ribs um, and the thoracic vertebra and the sternum, um, they all look uh, fine. Um, now the mediastinum um, and the mediastinal structures, um, the, the trachea um, looks normal. Um, and the mediastinum, certainly cranially, looks normal. Um, but what I want you guys to focus on is, is this area here, which sneakily is, is kind of on the edge of the film. Uh, and then this area here, which is the caudal mediastinum. So anyone have any thoughts on what might be going on there? Maybe in the esophagus. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, we've got this this increase in opacity in the dorsocaudal thorax, and it, it could be that, that that is just secondary to expiration. But the 
the increase in opacity is um, a little bit too marked for that. And we've also got well, this structure here, is to be able to know exactly what that is. Um, it, it doesn't really seem to be a pulmonary structure, but it's right on the edge of the film, which is um, not very convenient and makes it very difficult for us to assess it. But in this, in this VD view, we've got the cranial mediastinum here, and, and that looks fine. Um, and just as we look cordially along the midline, we've just got this little bulge here. Um, so we've got uh, just some bulging of, of the caudal mediastinum um, right at the midline. And, and we can be pretty confident that that's mediastinal because just because of where it is, it's bang in the middle. So it's unlikely that, that this increase in opacity that we can see in the dorsocaudal uh, thorax in this lateral view is going to be pulmonary because if it was, we would really expect to see it in the um, right caudal or the left caudal lung lobes. And rather than seeing anything in the pulmonary parenchyma here, what we're seeing is we're seeing kind of a, a bulgy caudal mediastinum, which, which is, is, is a little bit of a worry. Um, the other thing uh, to note here is that this dog has a whole bunch of bones um, in its stomach as well, um, which may or may not turn out to be significant in this case. Um, so um, to be uh, less sneaky, uh, we'll have a look at another radiograph, which is um, more centered on, on the area of interest. Um, so this is another right lateral radiograph. Uh, but this time, um, we've just moved caudally ever so slightly to try and highlight the um, dorsal caudal thorax. Um, so uh, anybody like to um, take this a little bit further um, and try and elaborate a little bit on what might be going on here? So we've got as far as uh, we're suspicious that, that there could be something going on in the caudal mediastinum. And in this bilateral view, we can see a focal increase in interstitial opacity and potentially an area of a focal area of mineralization in the dorsal caudal thorax. And in the VD view, we can see a large number of the caudal mediastinum. Is that so, a firm body? Yes, that's a, that's a good share. Um, so, uh, that is a diagnosis, however, rather than a radiographic description. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so how would you, how would you describe what's going on here? And there's not much more we can see in this view relative to what we can already see, but it's good practice to to go through some of the features here. Um, well, I would have said it's um, a bone opaque um, focal structure, um, just cranial to the diaphragm. Um, surrounded by kind of the, the soft tissue opacity that was described earlier. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think the, the thing that, that that stands out here is, is just the mineral opacity. So, so so now we can be pretty confident that there's definitely something mineralized there that, that shouldn't be there. So so this structure in the dorsal caudal thorax, it, it's almost more radio opaque than the adjacent ribs. Um, so it's, it's really very mineralized. We, we, we can't see that at all um, in the VD view. So wherever that thing is, it's probably here um, in the caudal of the assignment. Um, so esophageal foreign body is, is absolutely um, our top differential here. Um, so this dog um, went uh, and had a scope. And for those of you who have never seen what an esophageal foreign body looks like with a scope, it looks a bit like this. So I had to get our medic to explain exactly what was going on here. Um, so, so this is just sort of a bit of food. Um, so, so this dog was, was fed after um, it uh, had this foreign body lodged in its esophagus. So, so this thing we can pretty much ignore that's in the foreground. These are, these are the forceps that um, Seabird is going to use to, to grab this thing that's just behind it. So that, that's a big chunk of bone um, that's stuck in the esophagus. And that's that's what we can see on the radiographs. Um, so that's exactly what Seabird did. Um, so he grabbed this thing um, and pulled it out with, with these forceps. Um, and then that's what the esophagus looked like afterwards. Um, so this way down here um, is the cardiac center, and you, you can see that the walls of the esophagus um, are pretty inflamed and, and pretty angry um, after having that bone stuck there um, for a little while. Um, so yeah, this uh, this big mountain dog had been fed a whole bunch of bones, um, and some of those bones had got stuck um, in the esophagus. Um, so it was the um, part of the esophagus just between the um, the hyla region um, and the cardiac sphincter. Um, and uh, yeah, we can see them, we can see it on the radiograph, uh, particularly in, in this VD view. So uh, one of the reasons why I use this case is I think that this, this view really nicely highlights what um, a, a big esophagus looks like, a big caudal thoracic esophagus looks like in a VD view. So if you see 
that can embolge that soft tissue opacity on the midline, just caudal to the cardiac silhouette, in and the DV and VDV, and we see an increase in opacity um, in the dorsal caudal thorax. And in the lateral view, um, the patient is presenting with clinical signs compatible with an esophageal foreign body, um, then that, that should absolutely be on the differential list. Um, and, and here, um, it was difficult to see it initially because it was right on the edge of the film in that first lateral view. So we can see there's something mineralized there, um, and then it yeah, confirmed on endoscopy. Um, so this, this thing here is the bone, it's a bit of food material, um, and we were able to successfully remove it um, with the scope and the forceps. Um, so yeah, nice job, everyone. So that was an esophageal farm body. It was a big, big chunk of bone um, that got stuck um, in that caudal thoracic esophagus. All right, so does anybody have any questions at all about case number four? or indeed any of the cases that we've covered this evening. Okay, everybody happy? All right, great. So that's that's the four cases that we have for tonight. Um, so hopefully you guys um, have enjoyed them. Um, the session uh, is recorded, so if you'd like to have another look at them um, a little bit further down the line, then you can do. Um, but if everybody is happy, and if nobody has any other questions about any of today's cases, um, then I shall call it a night. And uh, thank you all very much for joining me again for this month's film reading session. Thank you. Thanks, no Great session. No thank you, Bye. Thanks, guys. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks for joining me. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>